So in 2009, the NASA Lunar Science Institute established the Shoemaker Distinguished Lunar Scientist Medal as an annual award given to a scientist who has significantly contributed to the field of lunar science throughout the course of their scientific career. Because Eugene Shoemaker was such an amazing scientist, we can easily now expand that to also include studies of asteroids. So we will continue to call it the Eugene Shoemaker Medal. And when you nominate people in the future, you don't have to be limited strictly to lunar science. Certainly include lunar science in your thinking, but please nominate people across the broad spectrum of what we now do at Survey. The first Distinguished Lunar Scientist Award was given posthumously to Gene Shoemaker, and it was presented to his wife, Carolyn. The second Shoemaker medalist was Don Wilhelms, who's with us here today. Don, are you here in the audience? I thought I saw you. There you are. Okay, thank you. Followed by Jeff Taylor. I don't think Jeff's here. Is Jeff here? Ah, ah, good. Thank you, Jeff. I didn't see you yet. That's wonderful. OK, great. And Stuart Ross Taylor in 2012. Stuart, is Ross here? No, OK. And Bill Hartman in 2013. I don't believe Bill's with us today. But he may be online. This is being broadcast, so we, you know, we, we have a lot of people listening in. Today it is my great pleasure to announce this year's award winner, Dr. Paul Spudis, Senior Staff Scientist at the Lunar and Planetary Institute in Houston, Texas. Can we give him a round of applause? So before Paul comes up to give you uh, his, his award talk, I'd like to tell you a little bit about him. Many of you know this, but some of you don't. Paul received his PhD from Arizona State University, where he also completed his undergraduate work. And it's a good thing, right? Because you can't get one without the other. <laughs> and he also got his master's degree from Brown University. His research focuses on the processes of impact and volcanism on the planet and requirements for a sustainable human presence on the moon. Paul is a co-investigator on one of the current survey teams led by David Crane. He was also a key member on the NLSI team that was also led by David Crane. Specifically, he's been helping assess impact based in geology on the moon and sites that might contain volatile element resources. Paul was also part of the NLSI NLSI team led by Ben Bussey, and still works with Ben's survey team. So he is providing one of those critical bridging elements crossing across the, the team lines. And I believe that's absolutely essential for the success of the Virtual Institute. Paul is currently the director of the LPI Summer Intern Program in Planetary Science for undergraduate students. So he also gives his time to students. He's contributed to many lunar missions, including leadership as the science team deputy for the Clementine mission in 94, principal investigator of the Mini-SAR imaging radar experiment on India's Chandrayaan-1 mission. He was also uh, providing service as a team member of the Mini-RF imaging radar on NASA's LRO mission. His keen insights and knowledge have been requested by high levels of our government, including his service as a member of the White House Synthesis Group in 1990-91 and the President's Commission on the Implementation of U.S. Space Exploration Policy in 2004. He was presented with NASA's Distinguished Public Service Medal in 2004 and is the recipient of the 2006 Von Karman Lectureship in Astronautics awarded by the AIAA. In 2011, he received the Space Pioneer Award from the National Space Society. Paul has authored over 100 scientific papers and six books, including The Once and Future Moon, a book for the general public in the Smithsonian Library of the Solar System series. With Ben Bussey, he's also an author of The Clementine Atlas of the Moon, published by Cambridge University Press. For more information about most anything you could wonder regarding the moon, including what Paul said when asked to testify before Congress in 2013, please go see his website. It's fascinating. I really enjoyed this website. It's spudislunarresources.com. All one word, spudislunarresources.
This is a comprehensive and fascinating site that should not be missed. I'm looking forward to the talk we are about to hear, and I will not stand in the way of that much longer. It is with great pleasure that I now present this year's Shoemaker Distinguished Scientist Medal to Paul Spudis. Congratulations, Paul. Well, thank you very much, Yvonne. I appreciate that. Uh, it, it is truly an honor for me to be here today and to talk about Gene Shoemaker and the one opportunity that Gene and I had to work together. And that was on the Clementine mission, which was 20 years ago. It was in 1994. And I want to talk a little bit about the Clementine mission, what we found scientifically from it. But also, I think the mission was significant in another way. I think it bent the curve. I think it directed the thrust of the American space program in a, in a way that a lot of people had not anticipated. And so with that sort of background, let's, let's get into it. Could I have the next slide, please? And as soon as that comes up. OK, let's go back a little bit to the late 80s and the early 90s. It had been roughly uh, 20 years since we had been to the moon. And the last American mission was the Apollo 17 mission to the moon. Um, we had tried to get a lunar orbiter flown for at least that period of time. Uh, right, at, right in the mid-70s, there was a proposed mission by JSC and JPL called Lunar Polar Orbiter. It was proposed and continually turned down. Uh, it was very frustrating because the lunar scientists had a ton of really superb data from Apollo. They had Apollo images. They had lunar samples. They had some sparse remote sensing data. But in fact, we really wanted a global reconnaissance to put all the Apollo data into a context. And so this mission was continually proposed and continually turned down. And then something very odd happened. Uh, on July 20th, 1989, there's that date again, uh, President George Herbert Walker Bush stood on the steps of the Air and Space Museum and proposed uh, something called, at the time, the Human Exploration Initiative. It later became the Space Exploration Initiative. And it basically proposed America would go back to the moon and then go to Mars. It was a moon-Mars proposal. As part of that, we needed additional data for the moon. And so JPL came up with a proposal. They had been looking at a small mission called Lunar Geosciences Orbiter in the, in the late 80s. They converted that into something called Lunar Observer. And Lunar Observer went through a non-advocate cost review, and it came out to be a billion dollars. And everybody choked, and, and, and we kind of froze in stasis once again. And again, we didn't get a start for a lunar orbiter. So NASA, in, in, in any event, NASA set up an office of exploration. The first administrator was a guy named Michael Griffin. He was the, uh, the deputy AA for uh, Codex, which was the office of exploration. And he proposed a series of smaller missions, basically break up the lunar observer complement into small spacecraft and call it Lunar Scout. There are going to be a bunch of scout missions. Could I have the next slide, please? At the same time, there was, uh, if we could go on, yes, thank you. The, there was another effort going on in space at the time, and that was by the Defense Department. There was a, an initiative called the Strategic Defense Initiative, which involved a lot of different concepts to provide missile defense for the United States. One of the concepts that was looked at in some detail was one by Lawrence Livermore called Brilliant Pebbles. Brilliant Pebbles, was, the idea was to send a bunch, a constellation of very small spacecraft all of which would have their own intelligence, their own propulsion, completely self-contained, and to act as kinetic interceptors or missiles. So it was a way to provide missile defense that didn't involve laser battle stations or anything that was unworkable, but it was thought we could launch a bunch of small satellites and swarms of them would act as a missile shield. A BP was a very small spacecraft. It was about a, mis a meter long, had its own propulsion system. It was three-axis stabilized. And it had a suite of sensors that could actually look at the visible and near-infrared. The idea was to track missiles and intercept them. So it turned out that a group at the Space Council, of which Pete Warden was one member, uh, came up with the idea of doing a test flight for a BP. 
But the, they didn't want to break the ABM treaty, and there was a specific ban in that against testing offensive missile systems in space. So they came up with the idea of flying a BP as a mission to some kind of deep space target. And an asteroid, a comet, and the moon were all looked at. I was brought into this as part of my work on synthesis. Uh, I was working with some people there. Stu knows that was one. And I, I knew Pete Warden at the time as well. And we all talked about the value of sending a BP to the moon. And when we looked at that complement of the instruments, it turned out that we could actually design a pretty capable lunar mission around the BP uh, spacecraft. So in 1989, Dick Truly, who was the administrator of NASA, signed a letter with the Associate uh, Secretary for Defense to do a joint test. SDIO and NASA would cooperate on testing a brilliant pebble by sending it to a deep space target. The ex exact definition of that mission was still to be done. I should point out one interesting thing about Clementine people don't realize was that from the start, it was an international mission. And it turned out that in the end, Clementine flew and got its data back from the moon largely because CNES, the French space agency, provided us with the data compression chip that allowed us to get all of the data that Clementine, Clementine obtained from the moon back down to Earth in a reasonable amount of time. As it turned out, we had a very limited amount of time around the moon because of the, uh, the constraints of the spacecraft and the lifetime of the spacecraft. Uh, next slide, please. So. The way this worked was uh, the Defense Department paid for the Clementine mission. NASA paid for the science team and provided some tracking using the Deep Space Network. Science team were about 13 of us. There's a picture of us uh, in the top right there. That's the meeting we had at Santa Maria, California, the day before the launch. We launched Clementine from Vandenberg, Slick 4 West, because there was no longer a launch pad for Titan IIs at, at the Cape. That had been dismantled years ago. But there was a Titan II launch pad at uh, Vandenberg. And so we went there. I remember it was a very cold morning, very windy, beautiful day, beautiful clear skies. And we watched Clementine go to the moon. And it was really interesting because right after that, we nearly lost the spacecraft. There were some wrong commands radioed up to it, and it went into a tumble. Uh, this might have been an omen. I don't know. But everyone was lost a lot of sleep over the next 72 hours. They finally managed to solve it and stabilize it. We almost lost the mission completely. Clementine took a, a slow boat route to the moon. We wanted to preserve as much of the propellant as we could. It had a biprop system. And to do that, it used a solid motor injector with some tweaks from the propulsion system later. And it went into two phasing loops, very long elliptical orbits that approached the moon with very low velocity. So our insertion velocity was very low. We went into an elliptical orbit uh, on February 19, 19th, uh, 1994. And we orbited the moon for 71 days. The elliptical orbit had a paraloon over 30 degrees south latitude. It went from about 400 kilometers to about 1,200 kilometers. And then we did a phasing maneuver in the middle of the mapping sequence to move the paraloon to 30 north. So the idea was we would take strips of images that would later mesh like slices of watermelon and basically tie together the whole moon. Uh, there was That phasing maneuver was important. It was in the middle of the mapping sequence. It actually gave us an opportunity to carry out an experiment that we had not planned on when we went to the moon. Next slide, please. I just uh, went through my snapshot collection and picked out a few things that kind of struck me as I went through it. Uh, Clementine was, was a lot of fun to work on. It was a, a small group. Uh, there was always activity. We worked in, 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 in a, a, a facility called the Bat Cave which was actually an old, beat-up National Guard armory in downtown Alexandria, Virginia. We converted it using all personal computers and small systems. There was a crew of about 10 to 12 people that actually flew the spacecraft. The scientists came in at random times. Usually, there was four to five scientists in residence in any given time. And we saw the data as it came in. We were making mosaics. We were looking at the color data. It was really exciting. It was my first real experience in being directly involved in a mission. I, I had been a Viking intern, so I knew a little bit about mission operations. But this was my first real mission to the moon. And for me, personally, it was, it was very gratifying, because I felt like I, I, I was actually there at the moon myself. When I first saw the pictures of the moon of the North Pole, and I recognized the crater, it was Nansen was the first picture we got. I knew we were on the moon. I recognized it. I felt very much at home. And I also felt very much a part of the mission, too. So this idea that there is manned exploration and unmanned exploration is not really true. The unmanned program is manned. It's just that people are all on the ground. Next slide. So what did we get from Clementine? 
Well, we got an amazing quantity of data. If effectively, we got an 11 color image of the entire lunar surface. Uh, 11 wavelengths in the visible and near infrared. The science team selected the filter band passes and they were selected with some degree of thought and care because the idea was we wanted to use this color data to characterize the mineralogy of the moon. Uh, there were some selected high resolution pictures. The high resolution camera was designed to uh, acquire intercept data when in deep space. So it had an image intensifier on it. And that made a lot of the high resolution images not quite as useful as they could have been. But nevertheless, we actually got complete mosaics of the very extreme latitudes of both poles in high resolution. Roughly a factor, uh, the, the, no the nominal mapping was on the order of one to 100 to 200 meters per pixel. The high res was about a factor of 10 better than that. In addition, it had, an it had a LIDAR system which fired laser pulses. And we were able to use that to make the first global topographic map of the moon. The problem was because of the elliptical orbit of Clementine, a lot of times we were further away from the moon than, we, than, than the, the range of the laser. And so, in fact, we did not get returns. So there were two missing caps to the altimetry data. We got altimetry from 70 north to 70 south. But because we orbited the, the pole so many times, we got redundant coverage over the pole. And we were able to make a stereo model of that from the images. So we actually combined those two to make the first global topographic map of the moon. In addition, Clementine data was added to the data that we had previously from Lunar Orbiter to make a global gravity map. It's not wasn't near as, as good and at high resolution as the existing gravity data, but it was the first chance we had to look at some of the far side uh, gravity anomalies. There was a star tracker camera that actually provided some scientific data. We were looking for evidence of levitated dust near the horizon of the moon. We looked for horizon glow with that. And finally, there was the improvised experiment. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. Next slide. So what was the science we got? That was sort of the data that we got. What science did we get? Well, I think for the first time, we were able to look at the global mineralogy and, and chemical composition of the moon at a fairly high degree of resolution. It was the, uh, like I say, the filter band passes were specifically designed to pick and identify the most prominent lunar minerals. Um, the polar environment and lighting we saw over the course of 71 days. Remember, the moon has a seasonal cycle that lasts half a year. So we did not get to observe the moon in the complete seasonal cycle. We saw the North Pole in the middle of the summer, and we saw the South Pole in the dead of winter. But nevertheless, we verified two things that had been postulated. One is that there were areas of permanent darkness near both poles. And secondly, that there were areas of what I like to call quasi-permanent solar illumination areas that get much more sunlight than 50% of the lunar day that equatorial and mid-latitude sites get. In addition, the topography and the gravity allowed us to map and remap the basin inventory of the moon. We were able to see old basins that had been mapped on the basis of photogeology. And at the same time, we were able to look in greater detail the basins that were already known. Uh, next slide, please. We've lost the slides. OK, so let me, let me cover these in, in a little more detail. I'll first talk about the, uh, the mineralogy and the petrology. Uh, a lot of times you'll see this, this garish, garishly colored uh, image of the moon from Clementine data. This is merely a convenient way of emphasizing the color. It's taking lunar color and stretching it to an extreme degree. So things that are red on this image are very red. Things that are blue are not quite as red. And things that are green and yellow actually represent the one micron absorption, which is caused by pyroxene in lunar rocks. So at a first glance, a look at this map kind of tells you what the crust of the moon is made of. But more than that, there's been detailed work with the Clementine images to extract spectra for various points on the moon. You can actually think of the Clementine data as an 11 band image cube, where we can actually take a pixel and look at the reflectance of that point in all the spectral bands. Uh, the map at the bottom of this image is some work by Stephanie Tompkins and Carly Peters that looked at all the central peaks on the moon and actually was able to classify them in terms of their major mafic mineralogy. And for the first time, we saw that there was a diversity of rock types at depth, that the average composition of the megaregolith was different than the composition of the crust at depth, which indicated that it had not been brecciated and thoroughly mixed as the upper surface layer had. Next slide, please. Oh, before I mention the SPA basin floor, we also noted in the spectral data there's a color anomaly associated with SPA. And in fact, the discovery of the importance and significance of South Pole Aiken Basin, I think, began with Clementine. 
We knew about SPA from Apollo. We had seen images of the Macis. Actually, Hartman and Kuiper had mapped Macis to the SPA basin back in 1962. You, they actually postulated there was a huge basin in the center of the far side on that basis. But we didn't really appreciate the size and the extent and the depth of SPA until we had seen it completely. We'd seen the entire basin. So SP, the finding of SPA as a fundamental event in early lunar history largely started with Clementine. Now, in addition to the mineralogical mapping, we also had chemical mapping. Uh, there was a very important paper published by uh, Paul Lucy, uh, Jeff Taylor was a co-author, and I forgot who was the other author? Eric Malaret. And uh, they developed a technique to extract iron data from spectral reflectance. The significance of that was the only other measurement of iron we have is from gamma ray or neutron spectroscopy, which is very low resolution. It's basically fixed by the altitude of the spacecraft. The Clementine data, on the other hand, are at full resolution, 100 meters per pixel. Using this technique, we can actually map the distribution of iron on the surface to a fair degree of detail. And what we found was that a lot of the things that we had postulated as being significant were showing up in the, in the data. I've included an iron map here of the Orientali Basin. And what you notice, this is some work that uh, Ben Bussey did when he was at the LPI as a postdoc. And what you notice is that there are massifs that are nearly zero in terms of the total iron content. That is also where we had seen from Earth-based spectral data uh, spectra indicating that there was no pyroxene absorption in these features. They are, in fact, peaks of pure anorthosite. They are pieces of the intact original lunar crust that have been brought up as the central peak ring of a multi-ring basin. And that documentation of that was a, was a good confirmation. In fact, what we were seeing in the iron data was really useful and significant. We could look in detail at the stratigraphy of certain areas and map them in terms of age and composition and sequence helping using this, this elemental data from Clementine. The global map down at the bottom, that's at low resolution. That was an early attempt when we basically took a subsampled version so we could handle, uh, get a reasonably sized data volume. We can now make maps uh, of the entire lunar surface with this technique at full resolution of the Clementine data, about 100 meters per pixel. Next slide. The other major advance came from geophysics. We were able, for the first time, to put together a topographic map of the planet from laser ranging. Now, Clementine was, was very crude. It was in a high orbit, so we didn't get strong returns. But nevertheless, we got enough returns. The actual data is shown up here in the, in the top right. You can see the various tracks. They're color-coded in terms of altimetry. All those were interpolated into a fairly low-resolution map. Uh, the average resolution of the Clementine topographic data is about 100, 100 kilometers, which is pretty crude. But at the same time, it's good enough that you can see the major trends. You can see the big basins. You can see the basin rings. You can see the major dichotomy of the near, the, the, the near side and the far side, and the South Pole Aiken Basin, which is the big dark feature in the bottom, bottom corner uh, of those maps. And from those, uh, the people at Goddard, Maria Zuber, and Dave Smith put together a series of maps showing the topography, the gravity, and the free air anomalies of the entire moon. One of the interesting things that came out of this was we really got an appreciation for how big and how well-preserved SPA is. We knew SPA was there. I had always expected it to be sort of a vague feature. Uh, it, it, it is very difficult to observe in the existing photographs. Once we saw the topography, we got a totally different picture of it. And it was, it's not only 2,600 kilometers across, but it's also over 13 kilometers deep. It's almost as deep as the day it formed. Uh, if, if you plot the depth diameter ratio of SPA on a trend of all basins, it actually falls on the fresh basin trend. So it's not filled, it's not, compensa it's not compensated, it's not been modified. It's just an amazing feature. And it also happens to be the locus of most of the geochemical anomalies on the moon, at least on the far side. Next slide. And I, this brings again to, to basins. I mentioned it earlier that it was sort of a surprise the extent to which the uh, basin topography was preserved, but also it's also a major compositional anomaly too. There's enriched iron in the floor of it. There is enrichment of mafic minerals of various types, including olivine and orthopyroxene, and clinopyroxene for that matter. And it really gave us a new appreciation for the effects of very large impacts. In addition, we saw better views of basins that we already knew about. Uh, this, I included the middle pit feature here is the interior of Schrodinger Basin, which we'll probably be hearing about more this week from Dave Kring. 
But actually, Gene Shoemaker made this map. This was one of Gene's last efforts to do some geology on the moon. And he, he was so impressed by the South Pole mosaic that he decided to sit down. He started mapping the geology of Schrodinger Basin. And uh, he wrote, published a paper with Mark Robinson on this in the Clementine Science issue. What I did was to look through the Clementine laser data to look for basins that I had mapped earlier on the basis of sometimes very scant evidence and see if they were real or not. And some of them, in fact, were real. Things like Mindel Rydberg, which is a very nice basin, it's beautifully preserved, even though it's totally buried by Orientale ejecta. But other basins, like al King, which is a very striking feature in the Apollo 16 photographs, simply doesn't exist. There's no evidence that there was ever a basin there. So the altimetry data is critical in validating and verifying some of these ancient basins and reconstructing the ancient cratering record of the moon. Next slide, please. Finally, we, the poles came into focus on Clementine. Now, we had taken pictures of the poles before. Lunar Orbiter 4, for example, mapped the entire near side of the moon and took a lot of pictures of the polar areas, multiple pictures as the lunar day progressed. But we did not systematically study the poles until we had a global mapping mission, Polar Orbit, which was effectively the Clementine mission, which put together a series of images of uniform scale acquired in a systematic manner. And what we found were these areas of permanent darkness. The South Pole mosaic, which is up there in the top left, was particularly striking because we saw an enormous zone of very dark terrain. And that actually got Gene thinking. He, I remember sitting with him in the Batcave one night, and he and I were looking at this. And he was really intrigued by the idea that there might be volatiles in the dark areas. He was very much a believer in that idea because one of Gene's interests, of course, was the study of, of asteroids and comets. And he knew that a lot of comets had hit the moon, that water had to go somewhere. And if those things were as cold as we thought they were, they might have preserved some of that water. The other thing that was interesting were areas that were appeared to be in light most of the time. Uh, some very good work that Ben did in the early, uh, uh, Ben Bussey did in the early uh, late 90s and early 2000s, focused on looking at areas near the poles that were in near permanent sunlight. We didn't find any areas that were in permanent sunlight all the time, but we found areas that were in sunlight for long periods of time, and that finding has been extended and veri verified by Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, which has mapped these in some detail. So what we have at the poles of the moon are areas of darkness in close proximity to areas of near permanent sunlight. And that got people thinking. Next slide. So we had the, the opportunity to conduct an experiment of opportunity. And Stu Nozette came up with this idea. We're sitting around one day looking at the polar dark area. And the thought was, we don't have any instruments on the spacecraft directly sense water. But we did have a transmitter at S-band. And so the idea was to beam radio waves into the dark area and then listen to the echoes and then try to separate the specular from the diffuse component and look at the polarization ratio of those two features. And we did that on during the time when we went from a southern paraloon to a northern paraloon. They were doing phasing loops. And what we had was this uh, geometry that you see in the top left figure the spacecraft slowly orbiting the moon, staring at the pole, and then we're listening to the echoes on the deep space network in the 70 meter dish. And what we found for, we had two orbits, one that went right through the pole, orbit 234, one that was off the pole in an area that actually got sunlight. So one went through the area of permanent darkness, and one ground track went through the area that gets the normal day-night cycle. And what we found was an enhancement of the circular polarization ratio through the dark area centered around beta zero, the zero phase point. This is classic behavior for coherent backscatter effect. And we published that in science in 1996. And, and we interpreted it to mean that there was ice present inside the crater Shackleton, which is near the south pole of the moon. Now, this set off an enormous fracas in the scientific community. It, it, a lot of people, the radar astronomers, didn't want to believe this. They thought we had misinterpreted the data. We had invented the data. But in fact, that finding set off the next decade of research focused on answering the question, is there water ice on the moon? And of course, we know how that turned out. Next slide, please. So that's sort of the Clementine mission. And, and that's the science we got from it. And I think for a small mission, it was really amazingly successful. And it, uh, but it did more than that. It was more than just a science mission. It was also a mission that changed the strategic direction in a very important way. You might remember a concept that got a lot of press about 20 years ago called faster, better, cheaper. 
And Dan Golden, who was the NASA administrator at that time, was famous for, for advocating this. He had come from TRW, which had worked partly on Brilliant Pebbles. The idea behind faster, cheaper, better is not that cheaper missions are necessarily better than more expensive ones. It's that if you have failures, you have more opportunity to send uh, other spacecraft to do the same mission. In other words, you get more flight opportunities the less you spend on the missions. That was the idea behind faster, cheaper, better. And in part, that philosophy was advocated in response to some very public and very serious failures that NASA had had around the 1990 time frame, the biggest one being Mars Observer, which is a billion dollar spacecraft that flew by Mars without injecting into orbit and was never heard from again. And that mission originally started out as a discovery concept, or it was called Planetary Observers. And the idea was to have a series of missions, all using the same bus, but with different instruments fixed to it, sent to different targets for different purposes. And that kind of got that concept discredited. But it shouldn't have, because in fact, Clementine demonstrated you could do faster, better, cheaper. Clementine took 22 months from project start to flight. It cost, in, in then-year dollars, $140 million, which was, which was a bargain, considering that uh, a lot of the NASA missions at the time from JPL were costing at least twice that. It was primarily a technology test bed. It space qualified 22 different technologies that a lot of them we take for granted now. For example, Clementine was the first mission that I'm aware of beyond low Earth orbit to fly solid state data recorder. It also flew things like low impact release mechanisms. It used to be you'd have explosive charges that would release folded solar panels, always the danger of causing damage to the spacecraft. Clementine used some, some paraffin wax actuated release mechanisms that actually are now common in common use on a lot of missions beyond low Earth orbit. Uh, a special panel convened by the National Research Council looked in detail at the lessons Clementine could teach them, and they concluded that it was actually, there were a lot of really interesting ideas behind the concept of faster, better, cheaper. It wasn't a stupid idea, it had value, and in fact, Clementine had documented that value. But more than that, I think Clementine left a legacy for lunar exploration. It showed us that the moon was interesting that the moon had good science, it had resources that we could use, and that it was a worthy destination for future missions, including human missions. I, the very first PI-led discovery mission was Lunar Prospector, which was the first one selected immediately after Clementine flew. And Lunar Prospector actually completed the LPO mission, the Lunar Polar Orbiter, by flying a gamma ray spectrometer, a neutron spectrometer, an alpha particle spectrometer. The instruments that we wanted to fly on LPO were flown collectively by Clementine and Lunar Prospector together. So those two missions gave us the first digital global data set for the moon that we have been looking at for so long. It also inspired the Smart One mission. Uh, I had a picture earlier of a guy in a Clementine cap. That was Wubo Ockels, who was a Dutch astronaut, came to the Clementine Mission Control Center, got really enthusiastic about the mission and how it was run, and went back to STEC uh, in, in Nordwijk, the Netherlands, and actually get, tried to get ESA to fly a lunar initiative. There were several attempts to get a lunar lander, a lunar orbiter. It finally ended up being, amazingly enough, a technology test bed, and that was SMART-1. But even so, SMART-1 helped us extend our knowledge of the lighting conditions at the poles. And then finally, there, there's a very significant mission that I'll mention, and that's Chang'e 2. Now, a lot of people have forgotten about this. The Chinese have sent three missions to the moon, Chang'e 1, 2, and 3. Chang'e 1 was their first orbiter, which made a global map. Chang'e 2 also made a global map. But what, what's interesting about Chang'e 2 is what happened to it afterwards. It orbited the moon for about a year, obtained a global imaging map for, uh, image map for the moon. It left lunar orbit and went off to Sun-Earth L2 and loitered for about eight months. Then it went into solar orbit and flew by an asteroid, the asteroid Geographos. Now that asteroid was our original target in Clementine. We missed it because after we left the moon, we had a stuck thruster that spun the spacecraft up, and we lost the spacecraft up. The mission was over. The, the mission was over. And that was one of Gene's biggest uh, disappointments, that we did not get to see the asteroid that he wanted to get to see, but we did get it with Chang'e 2. The real significance of Chang'e 2 is that, in fact, it shows us that the Chinese are developing the capability for cislunar presence and cislunar uh, uh, loitering which actually has some strategic implications. If you actually couple this idea with some of their anti-satellite tests, it actually is bringing Clementine back to its original origin as, in fact, the Department of Defense mission. 
that now the new strategic theater in space is cislunar space. And the Chinese are committed to a permanent presence in cislunar space. And the question is, are we? Next slide, please. Thank you. I want to close by just paying tribute to Gene. Uh, Gene was very much a part of this mission from a very early stage. Uh, a lot of people were threatened by Clementine. They were threatened by its existence, by how it was run, and by who had done it and why. But Gene defended it at every stage. Gene had enormous scientific prestige, not only as the founder of our science, but also as uh, a member of the National Academy. So the people who tried to step on Clementine and strangle it in its crib, Gene went to bat for us, and he won the battle. So we actually got Clementine largely because of Gene. And what's, it, it was tragic that he lost his chance to look at Geographos. He was really excited by that. I remember him, him and I talking about that at great, uh, at great length. But the other aspect that, that I think people don't realize is in regard to Gene's attitude towards the polar ice issue. Gene was heavily involved in the conception, the execution, and the interpretation of the Clementine bistatic experiment, and strongly supported the idea of ice in the dark areas of the moon. In fact, I was the apostate. I was the one who didn't believe in ice on the moon. And Gene and I had long discussions late at night in the Batcave looking at that south polar mosaic. And Gene is the guy that convinced me that ice on the moon was an important scientific problem, but more importantly, it was an important problem for space capability. And I thank him for that. I pay tribute to him. He's one of my heroes. And it's a great honor for me to accept that award in his name. If we can go to the last slide. Last slide, please. So I think Clementine was a real milestone. It was not only a scientific success, it was an operational success and a programmatic success. It was a strategic success in the sense that it pointed the direction back to the moon, not only as an important scientific destination, but as an enabling asset. And if, I, if you'll forgive me, I'll advertise my talk on uh, Wednesday morning about the same time. I'm going to talk about that very topic in a talk with that very name. The moon is complex and interesting, and more than that, it's valuable. And Clementine may be lost and gone forever, but it did find the gold it was looking for. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Paul. That was a wonderful talk.